Okay, welcome everybody. You are successfully joined up with Talking Biopolitics. This is Marcy Dardofsky. I'm the Executive Director here at the Center for Genetics and Society. And I'm very happy today that we're going to be uh, talking with Jonathan Marks and Dorothy Roberts about um, a troubling book, A Troublesome Inheritance by Nicholas Wade that came out earlier this year. Um, before we begin, I want to tell you that if by any chance you're having any technical difficulties hearing or seeing this webinar conversation, the most common problem is that you have too many applications open on your computer. So if you just go shut those down, you should improve the quality, the audio and visual quality. And if you do need any assistance, you can contact Charles Garzon at the email address or a phone number, uh, or by text at the phone number that you see on your, on your screen there. Talking Biopolitics is a series of interviews with um, actually amazing uh, scholars and advocates who are thinking about the social meaning and implications of um, bio, human biotechnology and a, a new biopolitics that we see emerging. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today and what you see on your screen there. At the bottom right of the screen, you should see a Q&A box, and that's where you can type your questions at any time during this webinar, and about midway through, we'll be bringing your questions and comments into the conversation. So go ahead and type those at any time. Um, I also want to let you know that there is a Twitter feed, and you can log into your Twitter account and join the Twitter conversation using the hashtag TalkingBiopolitics. Um, also, I want to let you know that we are recording this interview, and that's so that um, you can, you and your friends, colleagues, can listen and watch, listen to it and watch it later. Uh, what other housekeeping do I have for you? Let's see. Um, okay, let me start by showing you all the um, other talking biopolitics conversations that we that are available to you now on the Center for Genetics and Society website and on our YouTube channel. So uh, what you see on the screen are the series of amazing conversations we've had with um, these wonderful people, scholars and advocates. And um, all the links that you'll see on the slides I show you are live in case you want to click on any of them now. And we'll also be sending them all to you in a follow-up email. So if you don't want to be distracted, please just listen and you'll have that chance later on. Um, talking biopolitics is part of our efforts to to really instigate thinking and talking and um, advocacy uh, about um, human biotechnology from a social justice and human rights perspective. And um, that's really what the Center for Genetics and Society sees as our mission and as our goal. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the Center for Genetics and Society, and then I'll introduce Dorothy and John, and we'll get started with today's conversation. So the Center for Genetics and Society looks for responsible uses and effective societal governance of human genetic and assisted reproductive technology. And we work toward what we're calling a new biopolitics grounded in a series of values that you see there, social justice, human rights, ecological integrity, the common good, and democratic governance. And those values are kind of a filter through which we assess and evaluate new developments and figure out which of them are ones that should be supported, some of them enthusiastically, and which are developments that could wind up undermining those things that we're committed to. We do this <clears throat> in a series of ways. We um, work with media and communications and are regularly cited and interviewed and publish in outlets ranging from academic journals to daily newspapers. We have um, a very robust website with a treasure trove of information, and we have a newsletter that comes out every other week that we'd love you to subscribe to. <clears throat> In addition to our strategic communications program, we put a lot of effort into building a biopolitical network, and we want to hear what you're doing and what you're thinking about these issues as well, and really help form a group of like-minded people, people who are not necessarily on the same page, but in the same chapter of the book, about the meanings and the implications of these human biotech issues. 
We also intervene in policy situations where it seems appropriate, and we have done so at the state, national, and international level. And finally, thanks to some new project-specific funding, we've been able to expand our efforts to uh, do some advocacy-oriented research to fill the gaps in knowledge that we need to fill about these issues and their social meanings. Um, a bit later on in this conversation, in this hour, I'll say just a few more words about the many resources we offer and the ways that we hope that you'll be able to stay in touch with us about your own work and your own thinking about these topics. So just a couple more words about the logistics of today's event. Um, you've probably realized that we've muted all the lines except the ones being used by the presenters, and that's to improve the sound quality for everybody. I told you that we're going to be rec we are recording this so that you uh, will have a chance to review it later and pass it on to your friends and colleagues. And today's agenda is this. We'll begin with Dorothy and John giving some background about uh, Nicholas Wade's book, um, explaining the ways that they have engaged his arguments in the past and have engaged with the controversy that the book has sparked, and about their, their own work. Um, to confront the, um, the enduring um, legacy of scientific racism and racism in general, and, and what we can and should do about this. About midway through, as I said, we'll bring your questions and comments in and um, let uh, Dorothy and John address those. And just to remind you once more, please, um, at any point, submit your questions or comments using that Q&A box that you see on your screen. Okay. So Dorothy and John, can you now start, start sharing your webcams and I will be able to introduce you. Okay. Here's Dorothy, great. And John will be popping up in a moment. There he is, great. Okay, well welcome to both of you. And um, once again, welcome to everybody who's joined us. We have a great group of people. And <clears throat> let me just introduce you briefly and let you take it away. So Dorothy Roberts holds appointments in the law school and the departments of Africana Studies and Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. She is the author of um, a lot of articles and several highly acclaimed books, most recently, Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century. And we are very, very fortunate here at the Center for Genetics and Society to have Dorothy on our advisory board. Welcome, Dorothy. Jonathan Marks is Professor of Biological Anthropology at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. He's published five books, <clears throat> including What It Means to Be 98% Chimpanzee, Apes, People, and Their Genes, and also, I'll mention, Human Biodiversity, Genes, Race, and History. Welcome, John, and thanks so much to both of you for being here. I think this is a really important conversation and a really important assessment that we're going to launch into now. So take it away. Hello. Hello. I can't hear Dorothy. I can't hear Dorothy. Should I, should I start? While Dorothy, Dorothy, am I there? Am you I on now? Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. I I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay, great, great, great. So I thought uh, we could start by just pointing out that what Nicholas Wade writes in A Troublesome Inheritance isn't anything new or surprising for him. That he has been a science journalist since 1967, starting in nature and then science and then he moved to the New York Times in 1982 and has been writing about race and genetics in the New York Times since 1982 until he retired in 2012 and he has stated his theory about the evolutionary basis for separate independent biological races, five principal human races in the science pages of the New York Times, even on the front page of the New York Times, all this time. Uh, he, right after the mapping of the human genome, he announced in the New York Times that the next phase of the human genome project would be to confront 
a treacherous issue, the genetic differences between human races. Uh, in 2002, he had a front page story. Gene study identifies five main human populations where he claimed that uh, some genomic research mapped on exactly to these five principal human races, proving that they were actually natural in the human species. Uh, and he began to pit genomic scientists against social scientists with the genomic scientists telling the truth about race and the social scientists for ideological reasons uh, not being willing to tell the truth. I open my book, Fatal Invention, with a quote from Nicholas Wade, about that, I published that in 2011, uh, where he wrote in 2009 in the New York Times, the principal human races presumably emerged as the populations of each continent responded to different evolutionary pressures. So I think for, you know, John and I, he's been on our radar for a long time before uh, this book came out, and I have always been surprised that what he said about race was published so uncritically in the New York Times for so long. So uh, that's just some, some background about Nicholas Wade. Uh, this doesn't come out of nowhere for him. Absolutely. Um, and of course, you go back to his last book on human evolution, and he's freely speculating about ping pong genes in the Chinese. Um, and uh, it was pretty clear from the reviews that uh, it was reviewed in, in Science and Nature by anthropological geneticists um, who said it was a, a ridiculous thesis that he was advancing there. Um, and as you mentioned, the, the 2002 study that he talked about in the New York Times as, as validating five populations, five distinct populations, um, that's not the way the people who actually uh, did the study interpreted it, and, and he was told that at the time and misreported it anyway. So yeah, there's been a problem here for a long time. Um, this particular book, um, I guess, summarizes his ideas about human diversity. Um, it's sort of divided into two parts. Uh, the first part is about his belief that the human species really does come naturally partitioned um, into a fairly small and fairly small number of fairly discrete groups, um, which colloquially we would call races. Um, and he's outraged that scholars who teach about uh, the subject don't teach it that way. Um, so uh, he goes on about how uh, geneticists, or at least some of the genetic work that he is going to cite for you, he believes uh, uh, supports that view as opposed to what it is uh, the rest of us actually teach. Um, and then in the second half of the book, um, rather than engage with what we actually sort of know and what we think we know uh, about human diversity, he waves it all off as a, as a conspiracy of political correctness. Um, and in support of this, um, he sort of advances um, uh, on the relationship, I guess, between what economic history and social stratification on the one hand and genetics on the other. Um, and he says, all right, this is speculative, um, which I, I think he means as a disclaimer. You know, I'm, I'm writing science fiction here, but I'd like you to take it as fact. Um, but I think genetics is an important cause of uh, economic stratification and, and, uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, he goes on to suggest that the uh, Industrial Revolution had a basis in the spread of alleles for hard work and thrift. Um, and once again, even though historians and geneticists, that is to say, knowledgeable people, would strongly disagree with that interpretation, he says, hey, I'm just putting it out here. Um, and he concludes by talking about how he believes Jews are genetically adapted for capitalism. Interesting book. Well, don't forget the part, though, about Africans being tribal and genetically predisposed to war uh, and violence. So he has, but, but yet he says that he is not giving a hierarchy of superiority and an inferiority. That would make him a racist. So he's not a racist, even though he has this theory about the evolutionary development, not only of physical traits, 
separating races, but also social traits separating races. And he says that some of these traits are more advanced, that some of them are more beneficial, that some of them lead to more organized societies, while others of these traits lead to disorder and violence and poverty. And of course, it is the traits linked with Africans that lead to poverty and violence, the traits lead that are linked to Caucasians as those that uh, support democracy and capitalism. But this isn't racist because he's not placing a value on that. He is just simply stating uh, what uh, evolution seems to have produced. Now, on the, the point about speculation, he does have this disclaimer that the first part of his book is pure science, the part that presents this evolutionary theory that human beings divided into separate populations on different continents and, and evolved independent of each other so that they have enough distinct, distinctive traits that you can, uh, they, they were separated and you can treat them as discrete uh, um, principal races. Uh, that part, he says, is established science. It's just that for political correctness reasons, uh, we don't uh, hear that enough. But the speculative part, I think his argument isn't that he's saying it's science fiction. I think his argument is saying there is basis to believe this, but we haven't been allowed to explore it, again, because of the political correctness of social scientists who are imposing on genomic scientists this political ideology that, that treats this as racist, but it's really not. You know, a big part of his argument is that you can do racial science. You can do science based on this evolutionary theory of separate races without being a racist. Uh, and that's the appeal he's making to all of us to see the truth that he uh, is telling us in his book. But of course, um, if you believe that there are fairly discrete groups of people that have different innate endowments, how do you believe that's not racist? Or uh, what would it take <laughs> to, to define it into that category? That's a really interesting question. I had to read yeah, I have to read that argument over and over again to try to understand how he's distinguish, distinguishing between superiority in value and superiority in these traits that, uh, that, that uh, cause civilizations to advance. You know, he's, I suppose he's saying, I, I am not saying that people who are poor or warlike are inferior. I'm just saying that they have traits that make it less likely that they're going to be wealthy and, 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 and thrive. Uh, but clearly, that is, we, we do associate value to that. Besides it being completely unfounded, we do associate value to that. And uh, I, I think that that distinction between racial thinking and racism is, is a very false and dangerous distinction that he makes, and, and I think that some of his critics make. So one of my uh, issues with the response to Wade's book is that it tends to be about the speculation, the misuse of racial science toward what sounds to everybody else like racist arguments. But there's less criticism about the first part of his book that he says is you know, incontrovertible, uh, pure science. And I think that both he and his critics promote this view that there can be a separation between a, a, an evolutionary theory that race, racial divisions are innate uh, in human beings and the misuse of that theory for racist ends. And there's not enough critique of the racial assumptions that go into the science of biological race. 
Well, he certainly is um, trying to maintain a separation of facts and values that I think most people working in philosophy of science or science studies would say is simply untenable. Um, and of course, when he talks about the second half of the book being speculative, um, my interpretation of that is science fiction. You know, I, I tend to define, uh, uh, if you talk about sort of what might be true, that to me is science fiction, but science is what is probably true. Um, and consequently, if you've got sort of one study that you think overturns all of the knowledge that we have from a whole bunch of other studies, then you have to hold that one study up to a high degree of, of, of scrutiny, um, because it's always far more likely um, that the one study is wrong than that all of the other studies are wrong. So, you know, then the question is, what do we know about human diversity, about the patterns of human diversity? Um, and again, we've known for a number of decades from a lot of empirical research um, that, you know, most human diversity is patterned culturally, right? It, it's uh, uh, eating with chopsticks or eating with a fork or speaking French or speaking Chinese or deciding that horses are edible or deciding that dogs are edible or whatever. I mean, this is how um, most diversity in the human species is patterned. And that was the big discovery of anthropology in the 19th century. And if you somewhat perversely sort of separate off the cultural, ignore that, and just look at the biological, which, you know, okay, um, what you find is that the, the majority, the great bulk of diversity in the human species is patterned as, as cosmopolitan alleles. They're, the same alleles are found everywhere. We call it polymorphism in genetics. Um, if you want to ignore that, if you want to ignore the cultural and the polymorphic, um, then what you're left with is mostly clinal variation, varying gradually over geography. And if you want to ignore the cultural, the polymorphic, and the clinal, what's left is local variation. There's no climate of Africa. You know, um, so we know something about how human diversity is patterned, and that's what we teach. But who writes a book that starts off by saying the experts are lying to you? That's not science journalism. That's anti-science journalism. Yeah, but let me just add one other part that he leaves out, uh, and that's the political, at least when it comes to his argument. Of course, he, the way that he defends himself against the scientific evidence that you just stated is to say, well, people are against me for political reasons. I'm the only person who wants to tell the truth about race science and everybody else is lying because it's politically incorrect to say races are genetically different. By the way, there's a lot of research going on that is based in that premise, uh, looking for genetic differences at the, uh, among races you know, at the molecular level. But put, putting that aside, uh, he, he, he then tries, based on this initial false premise about the meaning of race, he then links it to the cultural or the social in ways that are false because of his, partly because of his initial premise, but also, as you said, also because of the, um, the uh, 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 speculative nature of it. But I also want to add the political that he leaves out. So he leaves out the way in which politics affects human behavior. You know, he points out that Nigeria and Haiti are poor because they uh, are filled with people who evolved to have uh, genes that predispose them to behaviors that make them poor. Uh, and make their cultures disorganized, their societies disorganized. Uh, he completely ignores anything political. Uh, uh, you know, he ignores slavery. He ignores colonialism. He ignores neocolonialism. He ignores uh, imperialism. He, you know, any, he ignores all of politics and the way and the influence that politics have on um, on. Uh, human behavior and on equality and inequality. Uh, and then he ignores the way in which he himself may be 
influenced by politics. Uh, he see, paints himself as a pure scientist, and everyone else is influenced by politics. So uh, there's this mix of science, politics, the social, the cultural, uh, that in his book that start from a false premise and then build on uh, each level uh, on falsehoods about uh, the way in which genes work and the way in which human history works. Yeah, he's entirely unpolitical, um, which is why uh, after all this discussion of how real races are, the only race that actually gets a chapter in his book are the Jews. And uh, yeah, yeah, there's no politics there at all, is there? Um, yeah, it's a good point. Uh, I think we've learned in the study of human diversity that there is no apolitical study of human diversity. I mean, it is biopolitics. And ultimately, you know, the only people who maintain that they are apolitical tend to be the most politically suspicious um, because they're either too naive to be trusted or they're lying. And certainly that's the way it has always been throughout the history of the study of human diversity. That's, you know, we've learned a lot. But you have to engage with the history of the discipline yeah. in order to confront that, which yeah, he's very reluctant that, to do. That also is related to something that I find that even those who criticize Wade for his the speculative half of the book may do themselves, which is to separate the current racial science from past instantiations of it. Uh, this, this idea that maybe there was eugenics in the past, there was scientific racism in the past, but today uh, scientists in the United States are doing it in a liberal democracy with, uh, where racism uh, has pretty much been done away with, and we can trust scientists to do science, even science based on the false premise that human beings are naturally divided into five principal races, as long as we make sure, you know, that the KKK doesn't get their hands on it and distort it. So this separation, of course, right, well, they, of course, they did get their hands on it, they love it. Well, they had, it before, they had copies of the book yeah, before yeah, the scholarly community yeah. did. You know, this raises the question before we take a break of why it is that this embrace of a biological definition of race is seeing a resurgence. At least that's my opinion that it, that it is. I, you know, and I, I try to document that in my book, Fatal Invention, that uh, Wade is not an eccentric. Again, he was reporting this on the front pages of the New York Times. It's not as if he hid his views. Uh, and there is this, there's criticism. There are many, many people like you, John, who, are, uh, who uh, disagree even with that basic premise. But there's also a lot of research going on that is looking for uh, racial differences at the genetic level and is proceeding based on the idea that there are African genes for asthma. African genes for HIV, African genes for violence, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and you know genes related uh, associated with other races as well for different not only medical differences but behavioral differences, and it raises the question of why now? Uh, I think why now because we are in an era where, despite claims that were post-racial and that the civil rights movement succeeded, there are increasing gaps in education, in incarceration, in wealth, in health, and this provides an explanation for why. It's a, a biological explanation for social inequality that also can produce profitable products to uh, treat these differences. But it's also something that we are familiar with um, because it does seem to happen every generation. Um, and I think what Wade probably had in mind as a model for his book was the bell curve from 20 years ago, 
which mercifully my students haven't even heard of because they were all born after That's the publication of the bell curve. Some of us go, go on, sorry. <laughs> people remember it, you know? Um, and, uh, it, and I'm sure it's no coincidence that um, basically one of the very few positive reviews that this book has received came from one of the co-authors of The Bell Curve, who's a political theorist, Charles Murray, not at all a geneticist or a scientist. The geneticists have repudiated it. The anthropologists have repudiated it. Um, who loves it? Well, the American Renaissance seems to like it, um, and uh, Charles Murray seems to like it. Well, that's a very non-random well, thing. Well, I, yeah, I should point out there was also a positive review in evolutionary psychology. Uh, and there's you know, there are behavior, oh. pardon me? That makes my point. I, that was one of my two graduate yeah. students, I yeah. think. So, yeah, so um, there are some behavioral scientists who, uh, who are willing to explore this theory, you know, and we are seeing articles in reputable jour scientific journals claiming a genetic cause or at least association with all sorts of social behaviors like voting. Uh, violence is an old one. Uh, and in a way, what if you start out with Wade's premise that uh, of an evolutionary theory of biological races, and you add uh, on to that the theories of uh, genetic causes for social behaviors, you it's pretty easy to put them together, which is exactly what Wade does in his book, and say that races are predisposed to certain uh, behaviors that determine whether or not they will be successful in the world. I think it is useful also to, to separate the, the several nested fallacies mm -hmm. in uh, Wade's book. You know, one fallacy involves what is the empirical structure of the human gene pool. Um, and that's, you know, the first half of the book that he gets wrong and claims that everybody else uh, uh, is uh, blind about it. Uh, but then you also have the, the other fallacy of, given that there are these fairly discrete groups of people, um, their behavioral innate propensities may be genetically uh, based rather than historically based. And then I think there's a, a, a third fallacy, which is sort of removing race from the discussion. Um, are general human behaviors readily explained by genetics? Um, and, and again, some, some of us older folks remember the claim that homosexuality is controlled by a gene on the X chromosome. Um, and, you know, that's fallen by the wayside. Uh, it was, it, when it was announced, it was on the cover of Time and Newsweek and, and the front page of the New York Times. Um, but in the post-human genome uh, uh, age, we've looked at XQ28. There's nothing there of relevance. Um, and, um, you know, that, that work has fallen by the wayside. But it's very tempting to come back to because it's, there's funding for, for neurobiology, funding for behavioral genetics, um, if I can try and convince you that there is a major effect on, of genetics on behavior, even though God knows we've been looking for it for a very, very long time, and we've come up empty. And we, we kind of realize that when you just racialize that, um, it, it's, it's not just an empirical fallacy. It, it, it's a fool's errand. And worse than that, it's a racist fool's errand. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are issues in maybe different disciplines and science need to need to get yeah, better connected. It's, it's over fascinating that. the way in which those various false pieces that you mentioned uh, have this traction that people, many people, even though there's no evidence for it, we looked for it, we can't find it. But maybe if we just spend, you know, some more millions and millions of dollars looking for the genes for these social behaviors, we'll find them. And just one, I, we have to move to a break in a second, but just one more falsehood is the idea that genomic researchers are 
are being bullied by social scientists. You know, that social scientists have so much power over JavaScript. It was so tough. Uh, whereas, you, as you mentioned, the, if you look at where the money is flowing, uh, it's definitely flowing more toward uh, genetic and genomic research than it is toward looking at the social determinants of uh, inequality. And then, uh, uh, in addition, we have social scientists that are arguing that uh, social scientists should be taking uh, account and incorporating some of these genetic theories of race into their work. So um, I think we've laid out <laughs> a number of uh, pieces of Wade's argument that are false. I would say beginning with the biological theory of race, if you, once you, you show that false premise, I, I think everything else collapses along with it. But uh, we need to take uh, a quick break. Um, so uh, just for a minute or two uh, before bringing uh, us back to the, the questions and comments. Oh, I can't hear Marcy. Oh, I, I, can hear, I can't hear you, Marcy. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, great. Okay, well, thanks to both of you. That was a great start, and we're going to keep going. There's a lot more to say um, in just a minute. And we're going to bring in people's questions and comments. Um, we already have some, and please, people who are listening and watching, feel free to um, type in your, your questions and type in your comments in the Q&A box that you see. And then we'll let those help us guide the rest of the conversation. But we just wanted to take a, a brief break and um, tell you about some of the resources that we want to call to your attention. So what you see there on the screen now are links to uh, web pages that have a lot of Dorothy's work and a lot of Jonathan's work, and then also to some of the resources available to you on the Center for Genetics and Society website, particularly about the many issues surrounding race and human biotechnology. So again, we'll be sending you all these links in a follow-up email. And we wanted to um, draw your attention to ways that you can stay involved with the Center for Genetics and Society and the work that we're trying to do to uh, build a new biopolitics. We would be very grateful if you would contribute to our work monetarily. And there's a donate button there that, again, we'll be sending you. We also um, hope that you'll make use of the information resources that are on our website. And we have a blog that's active with news postings um, every few days. We have a newsletter, Biopolitical Views and News, that comes out every other week. And we would love you to sign up for that. It's free, of course. And please do um, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Google Plus. So um, those are some ways that we can stay connected to each other, as well as with past and future talking biopolitics conversations. So OK, so now we get to keep going and um, to bring your questions and comments into the mix. Um, let me start by asking, um, by asking John, um, when you're talking about the bell curve and the way that these kinds of issues come back every generation. I think it's important to talk also, though, about the differences between the reception to the bell curve 20 years ago and the reception to troublesome inheritance this year. Can you say a little bit about that and what, how you explain that? Sure. Um, you know, when the bell curve came out in uh, 2000, and, in what, 1994, sorry, I'm so old, all these things sort of blend in. Um, it took, I think, a lot of people by surprise. We thought we had put all that behind us in, uh, in the world of, of the study of human differences. Um, and it took quite a while for an adequate response to come up from, from different areas of, uh, different relevant areas of the academy. Um, the American Anthropological Association came up with a statement and physical anthropologists came up with a statement. But it was all reactive, um, and it all took a couple of years. 
Um, and the interesting thing now, I think, is that social media um, have made the response time a lot quicker. Um, there was uh, some advance warning on Amazon, for example, um, that the book was coming out. Um, and as soon as it did come out, or you know, it was slightly before when they were giving out uh, review copies, um, we were able to look at that and, and sort of not just grope around in the dark for an op-ed possibility, um, but we were able to communicate amongst ourselves socially and, and really uh, uh, deal with this work comprehensively and, uh, and socially. Um, so that, you know, now, I guess, in this uh, interview that Wade did um, on the American Renaissance uh, uh, channel, he mentioned that the book is, is coming out in, in different languages. And I guess I sort of imagine an executive at Penguin, you know, going, uh, wow, we really got the Nazi demographic here. Boy, this book is really going to sell like hotcakes in German. Uh, they'll love it, you know. Um, but I have a feeling that when that happens, uh, when the book comes out in German uh, and in other, in other countries and other languages, um, they're going to discover that hate speech laws are a lot stricter elsewhere than they are in the U.S. Um, and he might find himself in a bit of a pickle. I wonder if he uh, might want to uh, delete the part about the Jews being genetically adapted to capitalism. I don't think that will go over very well in Germany these days. Right. Dorothy, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I, I think uh, John is right. Not only what, were we able to uh, address the book through social media, a lot of tweeting, and also uh, blogs that uh, and, and blog postings that came out uh, pointing out the, the weaknesses and flaws in the book, and then those were tweeted and uh, and put on Facebook. So the word spread. Uh, there were there was a lot more immediate criticism of the book, I think, that we saw with the bell curve. Also, I think there had been already uh, many books published in anticipation of this argument. You know, uh, so uh, many, I, I could go down the list, but, uh, you know, my book, John had written about this, um, Jonathan Kahn's book on Vidal, uh, um, I don't want to, I'll miss, I'll, I'll omit somebody, but there have been many books, recent books, um, Ruha Benjamin's book on, uh, uh, on um, democracy and science, people science. Um, I'm putting a plug to my friend Bob Sussman, who has a new book out on yeah. race published by Harvard University. Yeah, yeah, I shouldn't have gone down this list, <laughs> but the point is, there's a substantial literature by uh, scientists and, and social, both genetic life and uh, social scientists, um, Joseph Graves, an evolutionary biologist, you know, anticipating these kinds of arguments. And so there was already a literature, it didn't have to be written after the fact, it had already been published. Um, beforehand, in addition then to the reviews that were uh, targeted explicitly at um, the problems with this with uh, troublesome inheritance. Right. And then there were all these uh, very critical reviews, as well as this letter from um, many geneticists who repudiated Wade's use of their yeah. work. Uh, um, that, that was that was very gratifying um, because what he was trying to do in the book rhetorically was to suggest. Let me interrupt you because your voice, your audio quality just did that funny thing. So if you could How about now? try to ameliorate that. Perfect. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're fine. So one of the things he tried to do rhetorically in the book was to suggest that uh, the, the data of population genetics was somehow at odds with the data of anthropology on uh, human variation. Um, and it was very gratifying uh, to see that the geneticists uh, uh, basically said en masse that um, he misrepresents their work from top to bottom. 
And I think that's really important because it also shows that they were aware um, of what Nicholas Wade was up to for decades you know, at the New York Times and, and, and prior to that. I think they were suspicious about the way he was representing their work over the years. Right. Um, okay, and here's a question. Um, John and Dorothy, could you comment on how well scientists have responded or not responded to the 2006 study on Ashkenazi Jews by Cochran, Hardy, and Harpending? And um, that was a study that Wade and Charles Murray used. I, you know, I, the, the only reason that that paper actually got any attention at all was because Nicholas Wade wrote it up in the New York Times. Um, as far as I know, no serious attention is given to that particular uh, article, which uh, again suggests um, that uh, Ashkenazi Jews have a gene pool that predisposes them to intelligence um, that is the result of uh, being carriers of a bunch of um, uh, alleles that, when they're uh, uh, homozygous, cause uh, neurological diseases like Tay-Sachs disease and Gaucher's and things like that that are more frequent in Ashkenazi Jews than other populations. And their argument is that, well, if you're a carrier rather than uh, expressing the disease, then maybe that bumps up your IQ a little and it's good for the, for the genome. Um, I'm not sure how you account for the elevated frequency of BRCA1 in that particular context, but but you know they don't they don't really deal with that. But I don't think anybody serious has ever uh, given that a whole lot of attention. Uh, the people that work on Tay-Sachs disease interpret it as having spread by genetic drift, um, not by uh, natural selection at all. So I mean, once again, it's a it's a work of science fiction. That is to say, oh, it's a speculative idea. Um, but in science, we're interested in what's most likely, not what might be the case. And here's another question that, in a way, is similar because it's about you know where does the, where do the conclusions that are drawn come from? The question is, isn't we know that there's more genetic diversity on the African continent than in most other similarly sized geographical areas in the world? So how can that, uh, in ways uh, telling of the story, lead to warlike behavior? And that he, he, there's so many problems with his conception of race and the idea that races are these pretty homogeneous. I mean, they have to be homogeneous enough genetically to constitute a discrete population that's separable from others. And so you know, he has this theory that uh, after populations migrated out of Africa, uh, 50,000 years ago, they uh, landed on continents and independently uh, evolved to be distinctive enough, you know, to be considered separate races. And he doesn't really then account for the di tremendous diversity within these populations he's calling races. That's most distinctive when you think about Africa, because it is the most genetically diverse continent in the world. But it's also true about uh, other <laughs> so-called races as well, or, or the people that live on continents, that they're not homogeneous. There's a, a lot of diversity within all of these huge, major, principal races he's talking about. So he doesn't. He, he lumps everybody together. The idea that not, you know, on the one hand, that Africans are genetically similar enough to say that they developed these unique behavioral traits is ridiculous because the continent is so genetically diverse. But also the idea that all Africans have this trait. <laughs> You know, are warlike and tribal. How can you talk about the continent of Africa and paint everybody as tribal? It's, and then he also links this tribalism to something about Africans so that even when Africans are on other continents, 
are, and in other uh, environments, they maintain this <laughs> so-called social behavior. So he attributes this to Haitians. You know, he explains the reason Haiti is poor is because they have this trait. So it, it's so absurd <laughs> that it's almost hard. It, the idea that Africans are warlike and tribal uh, is, is just so silly. If you know anything about the continent of Africa, both socially, genetically, culturally, politically, it just is ludicrous. I, I have to say it just amazes me that uh, this would be published, this, this, this idea that anybody would ascribe to it is, is mind-blowing to me. So, you know, and, and, but again, there are two related fallacies there that I think it's helpful to disentangle. You know, on the one hand, uh, um, there is far more, you know, the genetic diversity of sub-Saharan Africans incorporates the genetic diversity of the rest of the world. So genetically, they are not comparable gene pools, the gene pool of sub-Saharan Africans and, let's say, the gene pool of, of Europeans. Those aren't comparable if the gene pool of Europeans essentially fits into the gene pool of Africa. And then the second thing is, uh, is the gene pool of Africans sufficiently homogeneous and are there uh, uh, these genes for tribal behaviors, uh, again, the genetic basis of tribal behavior goes back to the early horrid days of genetics in the United States where Charles Davenport was trying to explain why poor people are poor and the answer is because they have the genes for feeble-mindedness. And in genetics we've gotten beyond hypothesizing genes for any nouns you can come up with. Um, that's the genetics of 100 years ago. So he's really being completely retrogressive in the way he invokes genetics, and I think that's part of the reason that geneticists themselves um, are not jumping on his bandwagon the way they did, by the way, 100 years ago. 100 years ago, when Madison Grant wrote The Passing of the Great Race, one of the classics of American racist uh, literature, the geneticists reviewed that book by saying, hey, this is good for business. He is saying that uh, uh, genetics is the most important thing in life, and that's good for us. And it's interesting that 100 years later, geneticists aren't saying that at all. They're saying you're misrepresenting our science, and we don't want any part of this. And I, I think that's fantastic progress in uh, the study of human diversity in, in the academy. I, I wish, I, 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 not, to, not to rain on this parade, but I, I wish. I wish that genetic scientists were more outspoken, though, about the fallacy of innate racial divisions within the human species. Uh, I, 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 I applaud them for the letter uh, criticizing the second half of Wade's book and his misuse of their science to, to support these ridiculous speculations. But I wish more came out strongly, uh, you know, for example, when he was writing in the New York Times about the five principal human races, I wish that they came out more strongly and said he's wrong on that too. Because uh, there, as I said before, there still tends to be this separation between the possibility of doing research on, uh, you know, neutral scientific research on gene-based racial differences as long as you don't get into that speculative territory. Uh, and I, I think we need to understand the, the problems of the, the, the unscientific nature and the, and the racial assumptions, the false racial assumptions that go into the first part as well. Agreed, but if I can descend the glass half full. You know, to get 140 academics to sign on to something is, is quite an accomplishment in itself. I mean, if the question were, what is a gene, what is a population, you would not have gotten 140 prominent geneticists to agree to a, a simple definition. Yeah. So the faculty did sign that, I think that's right. I, I applaud that, and I also understand to get them all to sign on, it had to be a simple statement as it was, a short, simple statement 
about the most outrageous part of the book. I, I completely understand that. And again, I, I applaud them for writing the letter. But I think it's also a very unique act. I can't think of a parallel to that. Um, in fact, if memory serves, um, when the bell curve came out, there was a push by some people, like our friend Troy Duster, to try and get the American Society of Human Genetics to come out with a statement opposing the bell curve, and that was unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. time to improve. Okay, so John, you need to do your little uh, audio thing again while I ask you to turn to a question for the last few minutes that we have. Okay. <clears throat> One of our viewers, I think, asks a really good question about moving forward. The question is, what efforts can scholars pursue to establish more solid lines of interdisciplinary collaborations that can limit the perpetuation of biological determinism as in, in the situation w that which we have, which is where genetic, genomic, and epigenetic research receives more airplay in the media and, as you mentioned, more funding. Yeah. So I think that's a, a really good question about moving forward on how can scholars do that. And I'd like to add to that, how can um, science writers and reporters move forward in a good way to really repudiate that kind of racial thinking? I'd, I'd start out by saying, do their homework. I mean, there are a lot of books on this subject, and it's fascinating that Nicholas Wade doesn't seem to have availed himself of those books. He didn't do a whole lot of research on human genetic variation or human biological variation at all. Um, and when uh, Augustine Fuentes at Notre Dame and myself and a few other people um, uh, uh, criticized him um, in blog posts and, and elsewhere, um, his response was, oh, these people seem to have written a little bit somewhere uh, about uh, human variation, um, and they must be invested in the idea that human races aren't biologically naturally real categories. Um, but shouldn't he have read the work before writing his book? I mean, isn't, doesn't it usually go research, then writing the book, rather than writing the book, then doing research? So it, it is very confusing, but the fact is that there is a lot of material out there for interested colleagues all across the academy to access. And I would just add that I think what's really important, and we're seeing this at some centers around the country, including my program on race, science, and society uh, at Penn and Center for Genetics and Society, the effort to bring together biological scientists, social scientists, and humanists to study these questions. Uh, none of us has all the knowledge. We really need to work together, those of us who are committed to social justice and to uh, discrediting this idea of natural human uh, genetically distinct races uh, in the various sciences and humanities to work together to come up with another transformative paradigm of how to study and understand human beings and human inequality. That seems like a good place to wrap up, and I want to thank you both. I feel like we've just scratched the surface of the conversation, and, and we certainly just, I think, um, are beginning to do the work that needs to be done, and I want to thank you both for everything that you do for being part of this conversation. Also to everyone who's viewing and listening, thank you for the work that you do and the thinking that you do. And I hope we can find ways to work together and, and continue to figure this puzzle out. So again, this web conversation will be posted on our website. And I urge you to share it with your friends and colleagues. And uh, we'll be sending you an, an email follow-up with all the links that we've mentioned today. As soon as we wrap up here in just a few seconds, you'll be di directed to a short survey about today's event. And we really value your feedback about it and, and about future talking biopolitics possibilities. So thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you the next time. Bye.